for the next 40 or 50 minutes, um, we're going to be having a conversation. Uh, I call it a conversation, I'm going to be doing the majority of the talking, uh, but this is an interactive session. So if you've got any questions, if you want to field those as we're going along, or if you want to save them up to the end, then we can obviously uh, talk about things later. But we're going to have a conversation around solution selling and the value that that can add to your business. Technology is not enough is a, key, a series of keynote speeches and slides and thought processes put together by me, um, for which I share at exhibitions like this, and also um, I undertake consultancy as well. But why should we be looking at solution selling into your businesses? We want it so that your businesses can be seen as a proof point of difference to your customers away from a commodity sell where you actually add tangible value to your customer's business, where you're not just a commodity provider, you're just being assessed on price or commodity. And by introducing solution selling into the culture of your business, you will, and I guarantee this, you will have longer and more secure business relationships with your customers, deflecting that competitor intrusion and also, and most importantly, price does not become so sensitive in your proposition. Now you're looking at that thinking, oh, that's a utopian vision. And I speak from experience that it works. So today this presentation is formed into two parts. It's formed in the initial part of actually just sharing with you some thoughts and some stuff that's just going on in our industry. Where are we at right now? Let's understand where our thinking is. And the second part is a couple of case studies that I've actually personally worked on. One is a live campaign that we're currently working on at this, uh, at this moment in time. But where do I get my inspiration from and where should we as an industry get our inspiration from? Elon Musk is one of the great emerging global entrepreneurs that's currently getting a lot of press. And Elon is behind all these companies that you can see here at the foot of the page. Zip2, PayPal, Tesla, SpaceX. Tesla, for example, the most innovative automotive business that is in the market at this moment in time. In fact, Elon's battery technology, he's actually just released the patents for that technology to the global automotive industry in general because he believes that they are so far behind. So an innovator in his thinking, innovator in how he wants to share his information. But Elon said, he said, if you have to create a new company in an old or existing industry, you want to re-examine what people have taken for granted. Why would you want to inherit the mistakes of the past? So if we as a culture, if we as a business, as we as an industry are going to evolve our thinking and we're going to change how we do things, we've actually got to take a very hard look at ourselves to see how we currently think or how we currently are. These are some of my assumptions from my, some of my experiences. Are we as an industry too quick to be the lowest price? Yeah, probably we are. We stick to being safe. We stick to what we know. We stick within our comfort zone. As printers and print suppliers and in general, businesses are poor at market research. They're not really getting under the skin of their customers and the target industries that they're actually looking to attack. There is a lack of business planning in general. And so many companies tend to chase the today and not tomorrow. There's no business planning to actually go and evolve your solution and what you're going to take to um, market in the next 12 to 24 months. So somebody once said to me when I did keynote speaking, they said, Graham, they said, your audience is only ever going to take away five points from your presentation. So to help me to help you, I've decided what I think those five points are going to be today. So I want you to really get out of this presentation today that you must understand your customers' needs have changed and are changing. You have to adopt a change bent mentality from what I see in the industry as very linear, very straight line, to non-linear. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later in the presentation. That you're inspired by new digital technologies. Look around the room, look at this exhibition. How great are some of the technologies that are here today? Let's be inspired. How can we combine those technologies? And we're going to look at that a little bit later. 
But you must also understand that individual technologies on their own are not enough. We have to be clever in how we combine our solutions, how we create a cocktail, how we create those services to market. And most importantly, the importance of solution architecture. How do we visualize? How do we engage our customers? How do we get our, our customers to understand some of the complexities of the technologies that are currently in our palette to take to, take to market? As part of my consultancy role, um, I was talking in Singapore back in 2012. And after I'd finished a presentation very similar to this, this gentleman came and spoke to me, Thomas Chower. Thomas is the chairman of the Techwire Corporation in Singapore. There are 166 million Sing dollar business, about 100 million euro business in packaging, in flexo, and in logistics in the Asia Pacific region. And he said to me across the table, he said, Graham, how can you position my business where price is not the foremost reason why customers do business with Techwa? He was sick and tired of actually getting beaten up on price all the time, where everybody was negotiating with him. And he wanted to add value to the services, a more complex solution type proposition to his clients. And we're going to come back to Thomas just a little bit later on a project that we actually worked with him in the Singapore district. A road diverges in the desert. Lexus. The road you're on, John Anderton, is the one less traveled. Make sure you are John Anderton. Good evening. You can move the old-fashioned way. John Anderton. John Anderton. You can use a Guinness right about now. Stress out, John Anderton. Get away, John Anderton. Forget your problems. Hello, Mr. Yakamoto. Welcome back to the Gap. How does assorted tank tops work out for you? Now, what I find fascinating about that little bit of a video clip is that everybody's talking about personalization, everybody's talking about data, everybody's talking about target marketing. How are we going to talk to every individual person here on a one to one basis? Now, I actually think that video goes a little bit to the extreme. But the interesting thing about that is that that film was actually produced in 2002. Isn't it interesting that filmmakers were thinking back in 2002 and the people that put that film together, they thought that that's actually, maybe by 2015, how we were going to get communicated to, how we were going to get a little bit more of that one-to-one -one communication going from brands to their target customers. In a recent survey, 400 global CMOs recently questioned cited a response to how they saw the environment of marketing and communication. And the common theme and the common word that actually came out of that was turbulence. Now, only chief marketing officers could come up a word with a word called turbulence. But what they cited was that they saw that there was a fundamental change in the marketing operating model. It was becoming very, very complicated. But they were looking to build new skills internally to really grasp and understand the complexity of all the different forms of channel communication that were available to them. But they also cited they needed to work with the right set of partners. They need the right supply chain, the right companies, to actually, who actually understand their business. And finally, there's a greater need to focus on customer engagement and retention. Let's start thinking about what our print does. How does it engage? How does it retain customers? Is that in our psyche? Probably not in that linear thinking world. So when we look at complexity, there are over 133 different forms of marketing on that slide there. So I'll give you five minutes to remember them and then I'm going to test you. <laughs> so you can start to see now for the modern marketeer the complexity of bringing a combination of ideas, strategies, solutions, capabilities from all these different supply chain, the complexities of actually choosing probably five or six that are actually going to work for the campaign and the results he's trying to do. More worrying, though, 
is <clears throat> this was, a, this was a, 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 a map put together by Gartner. And more worrying, we look at this tube map here, and this is all of the modern day communication strategies that actually are available in the marketplace, and probably a few more since. But what staggers me here is that print and print communication does not figure on this map. So what does that tell, tell us? Does that tell us that we have an environment of customers who aren't open to the suggestion that print adds value to their communication strategy? Is that what's happening? Slightly worrying. I do like over here, um, oh, e emotion detection. I think that's a great one actually over there. That's really good. So earlier in the presentation, I spoke about one of my five key points and I spoke about taking you from a linear to a non-linear approach. I've got a really great three-minute video that I'd like you to watch now, um, put together by a gentleman called Alan Moore. People only start to pay attention when, in fact, you know, they start to hemorrhage cash. Then people are prepared to sit down and go, okay, explain to me what I need to be doing. What exactly are we doing? What reason are we here? Why do we exist? Is it just to make money? So the only straight lines made in nature are made by man. But nature's not like that. Nature's more networked. It's more like an ecology. And the reason why this is important is in fact that we now live in what many describe as the network society. Where we are creating, collaborating in ways which defy the logic of our industrial era. And this really is creating huge problems for people. People are sort of trying to deal with this new world, but they don't understand its language. They don't understand the logic. So my belief is that we need a new philosophy. We've got to sort of de-school ourselves in the logic of straight line thinking and re-school ourselves in a sort of a no straight line logic. So you've got to think hard about what type of value are you creating for your customers? How do you become attractive to these people? How do you inspire creativity and innovation? How could you use distributed intelligence to allow people to want to be part of that experience? And you have to focus on that to an almost sort of obsessive approach. And for me, that is really important to really understand this intimate relationship then between people, society, technology, commerce, communication, and media, because it affects every touch point of the way that our society is going to develop and evolve. So for the purposes of that video, let me just capture some of the highlights, some of the highlights that I think are important to you. We have to de-school ourselves away from the thinking of straight line logic. We have to start thinking in our businesses, if we're going to be different, We've got to de-school how we've always done things. Let's start again. What type of value are you creating for your customers? Apart from the services that you supply that they ask you to do on a regular basis, what type of value are you actually delivering in? How do you become attractive? The, the presentation after, after mine today is, a, is about creating a marketing strategy and a business plan. How are you going to become attractive to the markets that you want to, that you want to sell to? And how do you inspire create creativity and innovation? And that is about thinking differently. It's about thinking differently from your competition. So in a linear world, what does that look like in the majority of sort of production houses? We go and get a quote, we pitch for the job, the client tells us we're too expensive, we bring our price down, we do the job, we deliver it. And then some point throughout the week or the month, we're engaged in one of those exercises at the same time. What that's not delivering is that's not delivering value to our bottom line. That's just, we're just on a treadmill, we're just mice, we're just running, trying to keep the presses filled. So we're in this linear world. So think about what Alan was saying earlier about de-schooling ourselves. Let's think about some of the language 
Now, for me, this is a bit of an evolving slide for me. I'm writing an article or paper about this at the moment, about the language of my time, how the language has changed in my dialogue with my clients. And you can really start to see some really interesting phrases coming out on here. Consumer engagement, consumer acquisition, strategy and insight, target audience, offline, online. But the biggest thing that I talk about with my clients now is how am I driving outcomes? Somebody said to me the other day, they said, Graham, are you still in the printing industry? And I rather sort of jovially said to themselves, no, I'm in the outcomes business. Because all of the things I do nowadays drive to a positive outcome to the clients we serve. This is one of my heroes, Steve Jobs. And if you've not read this book, I would guarantee it's a compelling read. It's a brick. It's going to take you about two to three months to read it if you keep on dropping it and picking it up and dropping it and putting it down again. But it was really interesting. When I read this book, I really got to understand the power of Apple. We understand how great Apple is as a brand, don't we? And this is the point where I was saying at the beginning of the presentation about silo technologies. If we look at every one of these technologies that Apple has, iTunes, the library, iPod, iStore, iPad, iPhone, and iWatch, they're all great technologies in their own right. You could go and buy just an iWatch, and it's a great piece of tech. But the power that Apple has over us and why we keep coming back, and we do keep coming back because they're the, one of the most valuable businesses in the world. And what they charge for their products is far in excess of what Samsung charges for a sort of a comparable Android tablet. But the power of Apple is how they combine their technologies. It's how they pull them all together. We can buy a tune, we can download it, we can share it across five different devices. And now we can even listen to it on our bloody watch. How great is that? But more importantly, and the message here is more importantly, do we ever stop to think about paying one euro or 10 euros for an album? We don't. They make it easy for us to browse and purchase, to download and to share. So some of the things I'm going to talk to you about, some of the examples I'm going to show you in a minute, it just doesn't focus on one technology. It's a combination of technologies that really will make you successful in that solution selling. The next most important part about solution selling is finding the pain of the customer, OK? You have to really get under the skin of your customer to understand what their issues are. Now, the following example is nothing to do with print at all. I was speaking for Fuji Xerox in Hong Kong. And uh, we flew in on the Saturday, and on the Sunday, we had a free day before the seminar started on the Monday. And so we were free to just mill around the central business district and the retail district of Hong Kong. I'd never been to Hong Kong before. And we got down into the streets on a Sunday afternoon, and the streets are just absolutely littered with Filipino girls. And they're sitting by the curbside and they're chatting and they're sharing stories and they're sharing food. You're wondering where this is going, I know you are. <laughs> they're sharing food and they're sharing stories. Um, and all very genuinely happy. And, and why they're out on the street is because the um, families that they serve ask them not to be at home on the Sunday because they want to have private time with their family. It's the one day a week. So they have to go somewhere. So they go <laughs> into the center of Hong Kong. But as we walked a little bit further, and we turned this corner into Exchange Square, all of a sudden you saw all these Filipino girls packing up boxes of all products, frying pans, t-shirts, tea towels, towels, loads of different products. And they're sending them back. They're sending them back to their families in the Philippines. And what I was interested about was the support structure, okay? I was actually watching all these little courier companies that were lining up along the street. And there was one courier company that was doing by far, by far better than anybody else. And this was this guy here. So, okay, in this picture, he's got a bigger truck and he's got a loyalty card. But then when you looked at his loading bay, it was by far, probably 100% bigger than anybody else in that street, okay? So I really looked at it and I thought, why is he getting so much business and the other companies aren't? And this is why he was getting his business. He gave the girls boxes, pens, labels, and tape. 
He didn't charge for them. He just let the girls come down to his packing area, take the boxes away, and then just fill them up. And for that, they rewarded him with, the, with their delivery. So it's a very simple way to articulate how finding the pain of your customer can be so easy. And just by him doing that, he was far more successful than everybody else. So once we get to understand that pain, and we'll, we'll, we'll explore that a little bit more in context with our industry just a little bit later. What we must be aware of, though, when we're talking to customers about solution selling, okay, is where in the sales cycle should we get the customer? Okay? If a customer has already decided what he or she needs, you are at this end of the spectrum. This is where a specification already exists, the client already has in their mindset what they want to do, and subsequently they ask five or six or seven companies to pitch for the business. At this end of the spectrum, if you are being so wacky with your ideas and so out there that it possibly could never happen, but you think it could, you could be in a sales cycle of two years. So where you've got to hit the customer is just here. And I call this the curve of enterprise. It's where you found the pain point, it's where you've engaged with the customer with a concept and an idea and a thought process, that they have budget, they have the willingness to change, and we can capture that. On average, a sales process for solution selling takes on average 11 meetings, okay? And that's from my experience. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna start now taking all of what I just said and we're gonna try and now put it into some context, the big picture. Let's come back to Thomas and Tequa. So one of the things that we deployed for Thomas and his business in Singapore, when we first went in there, we went, look, let's just get all your customers in the room. And then what we're gonna do is let's hire a room and let's just talk about loads of technology. Let's just see what the enthusiasm, what the interest is from your clients in some of these emerging and disruptive technologies. And we spoke about data and web to print, QR codes, augmented reality, app downloads, uh, and also beacon, beacon technology. And what actually happened as a result of that meeting is the product and brand director for a company called Meji came up and spoke to us afterwards. And he said to me, look, I really get, I really want to use technology. I love augmentation. I want to understand how we can use augmented reality in relation to our packaging. How can you assist me? How can you make this work? But we come to the pain point of Meji. And I'm going to tell you this now for free, okay? Everything's free today. <laughs> I'm going to tell you this for free, okay? In a lot of cases, manufacturers, here they are on the left-hand side, you have the manufacturer who makes their product, they drop it into a wholesaler, they give it to a retailer, and the customer buys it from the retailer. Do you know the big problem with that? Linear, it's linear. You know the big problem with that, that line is that he very rarely gets to know who this person is. So one of the pain points for Meji was, and we understood was, how are we gonna use technology to actually engage with the customer? And then we needed to look at inspiration. Now, I'm sure everybody here is familiar with Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, a Raoul Dull famous children's story where Willy Wonka puts out into the general environment the possibility of five golden tickets to be won for five children to visit his factory. It made a great film. But actually, it was a failure. If we looked at it in its purest terms from a marketing perspective, that campaign was a failure because Willy Wonka only got to know the five people that came to his factory. He didn't actually get to know all the hundreds and thousands and millions of children that bought Wonka bars in all the candy shops. So we used this as our inspiration and we said, what if someone like Charlie Bucket in Singapore could win 4,000 Singapore dollars on the spot just by being, buying a product? So the campaign architecture that we executed, you can see here on the, uh, on the screen. And this is what I talk about articulating your solutions, putting your solutions into a visual format of how you can engage with your customers. So we have the brand owner over here, and we have printing technologies, and we also produce this on Litho and an HP 10,000 for some variable printing on the inside of the box. We printed the various flavors, 
They were shipped to the wholesaler and then to the retailer, and then they were bought by a customer. Okay? At that point there, the process almost was the same as previous. But then what we did was we created an augmentation, an interaction with that product by downloading an app. You played with the character on the box. And at the same time, you could enter a competition. And you could find out on the spot via the app whether you'd won 4,000 Singapore dollars. But before we tell you whether you've won or not, we're going to ask for your details. We're going to ask for your data. That data is registered, goes all the way back to the customer. And then the customer is a winner or a loser. And as a result of that, they can share that socially or virally. Now, I know I've gone through that very quickly with you, but can you see the importance of putting that together in a visual format, creating the story with your customers, how they can understand that? So I'm just going to play you a couple of videos, how that actually panned out. Oh, this, oh sorry, this was some of the support literature um, that actually went with the campaign as well. So this, this first stage here, um, is basically after somebody's downloaded the app. Uh, on this particular occasion, it was to an Android device. <clears throat> so what we also need to understand is all the support literature that went with this as well, the point of sale, the flyers, the banners, the exhibitions, the various events that they put around the shopping malls as well. And then what we got was a panda appearing on the box. So what you can see on that particular slide is that's very much about targeting the child. Peer pressure from the child to mum, and he, wants to, he or she wants to buy all the different flavours of the product as well because they want to interact with the different pieces of AR. And this is, the, um, this is the execution of the competition. So is this box going to be worth 4,000 Singapore dollars? So again, we're using the same app, the same device, but this time we're now seeing if we've actually won the Golden Panda. This is where we're capturing the customer detail. And at this point, once the data has actually been captured, it then reignites the camera or the AR reading device actually on that phone. And then it instigates another piece of AR, which is slightly different. Surprise, surprise, that was a winner. <laughs> Okay, all right, so you get the idea of the campaign. So what we've done is we've taken a printed product and we're starting to use now merging technologies, disruptive technologies, to create that compelling reason, filling the pain of the customer. We're actually creating a great outcome. So I know what you're gonna ask me next. You're gonna ask me what was the outcome of that campaign? So it resulted in 150,000 scans, okay? It was the most successful campaign that Meiji had ever run, with an over 10% response rate. And they now had a comprehensive capture of customer details that they'd never, ever had before. There was a 10%, a natural 10% increase in their Facebook lights, and the campaign data was giving support for future projects across the brand. And here is one of the winners of one of the, one of the lucky boxes. So let's just look at it in its purest form. How much value has now Tequa got? with Meiji. And if we come back to what Thomas said to me, how can I create a reason why price is not the reason why customers come to me for printing services? Now, by adding those technologies into his portfolio now, you can see how valuable he is. Um, I'm going to take you through it just very quickly now, a campaign that's currently live with my business. Um, and again, it follows the same sort of, sort of route 
the same sort of planning. It's more complex than the one you've just se seen. But it does drive print, it drives point of sale, it drives data capture, all the things that we were talking about earlier. So Glen Dimplex is the holding home appliances um, brand for all these products here. And what we did as a business, we analysed the current in-store promotions that was actually undertaken by the group. And this was before we'd even spoken to the brand or the marketing manager. So we'd instigated, we wanted to get into the consumer electronics industry and we chose this group as our target client. We analysed what they were promoting in store. We also analysed their comp competition. What offers and what products were their competition offering in store? But we also then looked at the pain of the customer. What do we see as the pain of the customer? You can see now I'm starting to follow a theme. They don't know their end customer well enough in relation to the interaction of buying a product. They don't communicate directly with their customers. They don't communicate with them on a regular basis about other products within their portfolio. They're using their data poorly. Their products need to stand out more. They're not combining their business intelligence across the group, and I'll show you that in a minute. And they were allowing the retailer to dominate the marketing, which they were very concerned about. And in fact, when we did a little bit more of a granular exercise in looking at their data pools, each one of these brands had, in some cases, three silo databases working within one brand. But the interesting thing about it is that none of these brands <clears throat> and the data that sat within the brands were being shared at all. So we came up with a concept for them to do an in-store promotion. And we worked in partnership, we got in contact with a um, partnership with a, a, a known retailer within the southeast region of the UK, <coughs> who as a result of this has increased their expenditure with Glen Dimplex because of the promotion that's been put together. So Glen Dimplex are already winning because this company here is buying more products from them. We initiated a review of their data and we created two push communications for them. One was around door drop, and one was around understanding where customers lived in relation to each local store. And another one was getting some cold data, some cold lists, to drive car target customers into the store. But the other thing about this was, is we weren't centric about whether we were pushing customers in. We also wanted to just capture anybody that might be just walking into the store. So fresh customers coming in. And what we've done is very similar to what you saw in the Meji campaign. We created a promotional product, a promotional campaign with point of sale. We have a flyer with a unique code that sits in the store. And there's a promotional giveaway, an instant win. In this case, it's going to be some pots and pans. We've also created an entry point in store on an Android device where they can enter the unique code from the flyer. And then as a result of entering that campaign, they also get a redemption mail, which is going to be a percentage off the purchase of the product. If I was to just go into Glen Dimplex and say, can I quote your print, please? Or can I do your point of sale for you, please? Or can I look at refining your data, please? That's great. But what the brand and the marketing manager needs to do is he, needs to under he or she needs to understand how that might combine and join up in a complete strategy. Okay, my clicker is frozen. Can you do it manually? Okay, you do it manually, okay, fine. So what we created was the point of sale, where the leaflet was, the entry point, the data capture, and then the redemption offer, which came through then to the phone. Next slide. So as I said earlier, that constituted hanging sign, wobblers, oven door stickers, counter display fires, and door stickers as well. Next slide. But the most important thing to the customer was this. And the most important thing in this journey, beyond me just being a provider of print, is now I'm in control of the quality of the data that this customer is now receiving. So up here, we've got a screen grab of some of the data that's being captured. Postal code area with full address behind that. I have an age demographic. I've got personal interests. Are they interested in audio, computing, cookery, gaming, movies, music? I've got their gender. I've got their mobile number. I've also got propensity around other products that they're likely to buy within that retail outlet. How much more valuable is that now to the brand manager? They can be so much targeted, even if they're not talking to me about 
running that target marketing campaign, that data is absolutely everything. Next slide. And now what they have is they have a consolidated database of all their customers. So we've brought all those siloed databases into one location where if somebody buys a Morphe Richards oven or iron today, that information can be shared with maybe the brand manager of Belling where they may be able to incite or promote the fact that buying a cooker. Now that's now added real value into the customer. And you can see now by combining those solutions and those strategies how valuable that is. Next slide. Okay, we're almost at the end. So here we go, price. We as suppliers are always under the pressure of price. We're always being asked to be negotiated, to bring our price down. We're always being compared. I can guarantee you right here, right now, that if you start working in a non-linear way, if you start working really differently, really hard, than your competition, you don't have to worry about price. You can look behind you because there won't be anybody close enough to you who's thinking in the way that you're thinking to deliver those solutions that I've just shared with you today. So price completely goes away from the conversation. Not to say you can charge any price whatsoever, but you will yield a better margin as a result of actually controlling or combining or managing those solutions. So let's get back to my five points and hopefully I've articulated it well enough in the presentation today for you to get what I was saying. So hopefully you get that you must understand your customers' needs are changing. You have to adopt that change mentality from a linear to a non-linear approach, okay? Start working outside of your comfort zone. You have to adopt that change mentality, we've done that, that you're inspired by new digital technologies. Let's hope today that you've actually seen by combining some of those technologies today, it's inspired you that one technology is not the answer. Think about Apple, what the value I said about Apple earlier, about combining those technologies, how good is that? And the importance of solution architecture when selling your enterprise solution. That if you visually articulate those solutions into a flow diagram and a flow chart, how much more easy is it for the customer to understand? It's in Apple's DNA that technology alone is not enough. It's technology married with liberal arts, married with the humanities, that yields us the result that makes our hearts sing. Next slide. Technology alone is not enough. It's technology married with the liberal arts, married with the humanities that yields us the results that truly make our hearts sing. If just today I've captured your imagination in this presentation, I've done a great job. But the technology alone won't give you the answers. You can buy it, you can put it on your shop floor, you can talk about it to your customers. But it's every single one of you here today is how you apply yourself to that technology that will give you greater value and return to your business. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of my presentation today. I'd like to thank you for, uh, for attending. If you've got any questions, please feel free to come and give me, uh, give me a shout. Thank you.